I'm Ollie Flower. This is a Petra Kutcher specifically about prognostication post aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. It's part of five PKs discussing this topic. I'll talk about why it's important, factors that affect prognosis, and the various grading systems that are being used. See the suggested resources for a more expansive discussion on this big and important topic. So why is it important? The patient, their family, as well as you and all the treating teams will want to know how things will play out. You won't get the answer, but knowing what affects prognosis will give you more of the picture. Some factors that affect prognosis are modifiable, so we clearly need to know what these are to get the best outcomes for our patients. Mortality rates have decreased in the last three decades, from about 57% in the mid-70s to around 35% now, depending on where you are and how accurately data is collected on pre-hospital deaths. Some of this is improved care, and some the fact that pessimism about poor-grade subarachnoid hemorrhage became a self-fulfilling prophecy. 10 to 15% of patients die before they reach hospital. Morbidity and mortality increases with age and is related to the overall health of your patient. Rates of persistent dependence are somewhere between 8 and 20%, and the scales commonly used to assess outcomes are relatively insensitive to cognitive impairment, behavioural changes, social readjustment and energy levels, and may underestimate the effect of subarach on function and quality of life of survivors. The most important predictive factors for acute prognosis after subarach are the level of consciousness and neurological grade on admission, the patient's age, and the amount of blood on the initial head CT. Some causes of poor initial grade are eminently treatable and reversible, such as intraventricular hemorrhage or hydrocephalus or seizures, and this obviously affects prognosis. There are various types of neurological grading systems which warrant discussion as they're fairly different. GCS is not a true subarach grading scale. Only GCSs of 14 to 15 correlate with good outcomes, whereas lower scores don't appear to directly correlate with outcomes. The motor component's probably the most important part of the score, so we have to be precise with our knowledge of how to score the GCS and assess it before giving drugs and intubating. The Hunt and Hess scale, originally introduced in 1968, was intended as an index of surgical risk. It's more subjective as it uses terms such as mild headache, slight nuchal rigidity, drowsy or confused, stupor, deep coma, which are hard to quantify and patients can straddle grades. The WFNS, not to be confused with WWF, which was also from Kirker 1988, should now be considered the standardised clinical score. It stands for the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies. It's more objective than Hunt and Hess, but it is reliant on getting the GCS right. Radiological grading systems were initially designed to help predict vasospasm using the premise that more blood predicts more vasospasm. The Fisher was the original, designed back in 1980, and is validated to predict the likelihood of vasospasm and has pretty minimal inter-observer variability. There are four grades, one to four, one being no blood and four being lots with intraventricular clots. The Claassen scale, designed in 2001, predicts the risk of a specific clinical endpoint, i.e. delayed cerebral ischemia. Unlike the Fisher scale, Claassen takes into account the separate and additive risk of subarach and intraventricular hemorrhage. There are five possible grades, ranging from no blood to completely filling one or more cistern or fissure with bilateral IVH. One scale combines radiological and physical findings. The Ogilvy and Carter scale developed in 1998. This uses age, Hunt and Hess grade, fissure grade and aneurysm size. It has minimal inter-observer variability, but studies evaluating it have been flawed and it carries the inherent problems of the Hunt and Hess and fissure systems. So, from these scoring systems we have some idea of how things may pan out, with the clinical score more predictive of outcome and the radiological ones for vasospasm. None of the grading systems have particularly impressive sensitivity or specificity, and nearly half of the patients with poor scale grades on admission have good outcomes. Also remember that if a patient has acute hydrocephalus, non-convulsive seizures, if they're post-ictal, or if they've been given medications that affect assessment, the clinical grading systems will be inaccurate. Now we'll look at other factors that impact upon outcome. These can be factors beyond our control or ones which we can potentially modify. We know that increasing age correlates with worse outcomes. Other factors from the history that are important include any severe medical illness, hypertension, particularly elevated systolic blood pressure on admission, previous myocardial infarction, liver disease, smoking, and previous subarachnoid hemorrhage. Aneurysm factors that convey a worse outcome include ruptured posterior circulation aneurysms with anterior circulation ones having a better prognosis, larger aneurysm size, more complex aneurysm configuration, global cerebral edema on CT, 
and intracerebral hematoma or intraventricular hemorrhage. There are some variables that affect outcome that we may be able to influence, including rebleeding, so secure the aneurysm as soon as possible, fever, so aggressively aim for normothermia, use of anticonvulsants, so try to stop phenytoin at day three if there's no evidence of seizures, delayed cerebral ischemia from vasospasm, so have a high vigilance for this and avoid dehydration, and treat as we discussed in the previous PK. Hyperglycemia and anemia we've discussed before and they're independently predictors of poor prognostic outcomes. Complications such as pneumonia and sepsis do happen but there are ways in which we can make them less likely so do that. Treat in high volume centres with availability of neurosurgical and endovascular services and look at the additional resources for more information about this. There are other monitoring techniques which are largely investigational at the moment but show promise and these include cerebral microdialysis, continuous electroencephalography or EEG and brain tissue oxygenation tension monitoring. None of these alone have been shown to be sensitive enough to predict outcome but all potentially add information to the overall picture. If and when patients clinically improve, comprehensive neuropsychiatric evaluations warranted. It's common to find behavioural and psychosocial difficulties as well as poor physical and mental endurance. Multidisciplinary rehabilitation affects functional prognosis and is a crucial part of getting patients back to the lives they led and the jobs they did before their bleed. So that's the end of the last PK. Think about all the factors discussed to get the fullest picture you can. Realise that even poor grade patients have room for improvement and pessimism leads to self-fulfilling prophecies. Accept that even with all this information, you'll only get probabilities rather than certainties and no one really knows what the outcome will be. Thanks for listening.